Welcome, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to continue the Josep Carreras Distinguished Lectures. Um, today, we have an, an online presentation by Professor Dario Alessi from the University of Dundee. Um, Dario, uh, we we're talking before, Dario was, was, was born in France, although he did high school in, in Brussels, and then uh, he, he moved to the United Kingdom. Um, he obtained the, the BSc and the PhD from the University of Birmingham, and, uh, the, and the postdoctoral training was at the University uh, of Dundee. Um, in the University of Dundee, he eventually became the program leader and the MRC Protein Phosphorylation and Ubiquitylation Unit, and uh, later he was appointed as director. He also serves as director of the Dundee Signal Transition Therapy Unit. Um, Professor um, Alessi is known uh, as a well-renowned biochemist, one of the, maybe not so fashionable anymore, but biochemist is the, the base of all the things that we do every day in, in the lab. And he has been studying protein phosphorylation and ubiquitylation in many human diseases from his work, um, understanding PDK1 in diabetes, LKB1 in cancer, WNK8 in blood uh, pressure, and now uh, pressure, and now uh, the role of uh, LR RK2 in uh, Parkinson's disease. He has received many awards and recognition for this. Among these, the Francis Crick Medic Medal and Lecture, the Janted Colin Prize from Translational Medicine, uh, member of the UK Royal Society, etc. So it's a pleasure to have uh, uh, Dario with us, and he's going to talk about the interplay between uh, this kinase and rap GTPases in Parkinson. Uh, remember that you can ask questions using the, the program you have here, and there are also possibility to send your questions using that system. Uh, Dario, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you so much for the, you know, the very kind and generous introduction. And yes, I, I do consider myself as a biochemist. And I, I, I agree that sort of biochemistry now in, is, isn't so well uh, respected as maybe it was once in, in the upon a time. But recently, someone in America told me, you should call yourself a biochemical engineer. <laughs> that sounds much more impressive than the biochemist. <laughs> I introduced myself as a biochemist, and they 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 corrected me on this. So anyway, you know, so yeah, I've always been interested in uh, understanding signaling pathways, uh, understanding how the signal is recognised and how it moves down the pathway to elicit a physiological response. That's sort of been always been my core interest. And you you know, as you all know, and from your work in cancer, this this. This is really important because it's disruptions in these highways of communication that uh, you know lead to almost all human diseases, not just uh, you know not just cancer. And uh, you know, so then the idea is obviously understand the pathway. You you can develop better ways to you know to diagnose disease, and and then obviously you know play the engineer and develop better ways to uh, you know treat this uh you, you know the, this condition so at the, the heart of all signaling pathways is uh, uh you, you know is protein phosphorylation that uh changes the activity of proteins in, in all conceivable manners and the kinases and the phosphatases that regulate this this phosphorylation and uh, i mean as you know in your field of cancer research uh, you know i think there's 113 ap approved therapies now most of them in cancer that target various protein kinases. Most of the small molecules, but there's an increasing number using antibody uh, approaches, and and these are, you know, have really transformed the treatment of uh, many types of, uh, you, you know, you know, in cancer and benefited patients extraordinarily who who suffer from these, uh, you know, cancers. So. Uh, yeah, no, so I, I used to work on, on kinases like LKB1 and PDK1 and AKT that were involved in the cancer pathway. I also worked on, on, on pathways involved in, uh, in regulating blood pressure. This is the WINK1 kinase. But, I mean, I was working on all of these other pathways. But in 2004, I, I just came across, just by doing some general reading, uh, you know, the... Uh, you know that there were these kinases called well kinase called LARC2, LRRK2. That uh, you know these two papers were were published reporting that mutations in this kinase could cause Parkinson's disease. And uh, 
you know, you know, I, I just find it very interesting that a kinase could be um, linked to, uh, to to causing a disease such as Parkinson's disease, and uh, and I, I thought that if you could understand how LARC2 functions, it could maybe lead to a new way to better diagnose and, and maybe even treat Parkinson's disease. And I was very lucky because I, I, you know, I worked in I work in an MRC unit which gives you long-term funding that enables you to explore curiosity-driven research, which I think nowadays is becoming harder and harder. You've got to more or less work on the projects that your grants are written on. But at those times, you know, we were allowed to, you know, explore wild, you know, explore wild ideas and, uh, you know, not be penalized by our, our funding bodies. And so, um, yeah, so it, it was known in, in 2004 the, the LARC2 kinase, it was a complicated kinase. It has actually 2,500 amino acids and it has numerous different domains. It actually has two catalyt catalytic domains. In addition to a kinase domain, it has an atypical GTPase domain that's made up of a rock core and core A and core B domain. And the initial, the initial paper suggested mutations in either the GTPase domain or the kinase domain were linked to. Parkinson's disease. And I, I put the G2019S here in bold because this is the most common mutation. And uh, yeah, in fact, the um, this is quite common in Spain and the Catalan. And in fact, many of our collaborators, you know, are, are based in, 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 in Barcelona or on, on, on the Basque countries or in Galicia as well, where, where there's, uh, you know, large populations of, of people with these mutations. And especially this R1441G mutation is very common in San Sebastian, uh, nearby, not too far from Barcelona. And, um, you know, so uh, I just want to say a few words. I know you work in, in cancer research. So you might not think about Parkinson's disease very much. It's, uh, it affects around 10 million people worldwide. It's the second most common neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. And, 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 there, and there's, no, there's no treatments that can slow the progression of the disease down. Some of the drugs that are used, uh, you, you know, uh, replace dopamine that's lost in, in, in the disease. And, and, and these, uh, you know, treat some of the symptoms such as the tremors and the slowness of movement that, 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 that characterizes this, that, this disease, but they don't affect disease progression. And yes, this is quite shocking that the, the main line of therapy now is still do dopamine replacement. And then this was identified in 1967, that, that this was the year I was born. And basically since 1967, you know, there's only been really incremental, you know, improvements in the, in the delivery methods of these, uh, the, these dopamine replacement therapies. So uh, there's, a, there's a really urgent need to, uh, you know, to develop treatments for, for, for this, you know, for this condition. And, and so, so the LARC2, it turns out that it's, it's, it's actually one of the most common causes of genetic familial Parkinson's disease. And if you have a family history of, of Parkinson's disease, there's a five to 10% chance that you'll have the, the LARC2 mutation. Obviously, depending where you live in the world, that could be much, you know, much higher. And uh, it's thought that one or 2% of all the people in, in the world with a uh, with Parkinson's disease have uh, have this have have this mutation, and the, the disease that's driven by the LARC2 mutation resembles that of the common form of the disease. Then, and, and this includes sort of age of onset in the often in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So it's not early onset; it's more late and onset. And the symptoms are very similar to the the common sporadic form of, of the disease. And and an important question that we, that we don't have the answer to is, you know, is you know, ninety percent of people have the the idiopathic sporadic form of the disease that don't have mutations in LARC2. But the question is whether LARC2 is involved in driving this idiopathic form of the disease. So, um, you know, so the first question I mean, I'm just going to give you quite it's in the, quite a general seminar today. So, you know, the, one of the first questions we asked in the, in this area was. How do these mutations impact, you know, the kinase activity for for LARC2? And and, and this was experiments we did, uh, you know, in 2007, so an extremely long time ago, where we expressed 
you know, the Lark 2 kinase. And we, we couldn't in those days express the full length protein. So we expressed the, the catalytic region of, of, of the protein. And then we made the wild type protein. And then we made the, the, the pathogenic form of the protein. And we had no substrates in those days. So we just measured autophosphorylation, but we could measure enhanced autophosphorylation with the, uh, the pathogenic mutation, suggesting that this might be activating. So in, in an attempt to develop a, a, a proper, because for kinases, you really need to have a, a substrate, even if it's an artificial substrate, you need a substrate to measure, robustly measure, you know, kinase activity. So, so, so to find such a substrate, we, uh, we, we just did a simple sort of method that's known as a Kestrel scream. It's just a biochemical method where you take a rat brain extract and, and you screen basically every fraction of, of that extract with activated LARC2 to look for proteins that become phosphorylated. And then you try and purify these substrates through uh, heparin Q and, and, and gel filtration. And, and by doing this, we, uh, we, we found one protein that was called myosin. This is a cytoskeletal protein that was phosphorylated in vitro by, uh, you, you know, LARC2. And, um, and then we found this was phosphorylated at a very conserved C-terminal site called threonine 558. So, um, so this was actually good and bad. It was good because we, we were able to um, develop a, um, a robust physiological assay for, for LARC2. And we also made a peptide that, that was used by, you know, to, um, you know, to assay the enzyme. But it was bad in the sense that then we spent, you know, the next three or four years trying to validate this as a physiological substrate, and it turned out not to be. So this was just a sort of an in vitro phenomenon. But the reason why it was quite important is because then it enabled us to do, you know, proper biochemical results to demonstrate that uh, the G2019S mutation enhanced the LARC2 kinase activity. And this stimulated many pharmaceutical companies to, to use the technologies developed in this, uh, you know, in, in these studies to uh, develop assays for LARC2 and develop LARC2 kinase inhibitors, which, are now have, have, which have now progressed into clinical trials. And I'll say, you know, more about that towards the end of my talk. And, um, you know, so, so we and others, you know, the companies I said, went to look for LARC2 inhibitors. We've collaborated with Nathaniel Gray in, in Harvard, who, uh, who, who, who developed this compound here that was a highly selective LARC2 inhibitor. And, and, and then obviously these compounds work very well in vitro, but we had no way of assaying them in cells. And you know, so we, we, we developed a cellular assay by uh, finding that you know, LARC2 was phosphorylated on these two sites in cells that could bind 1433. And, um, and very interestingly, when you inhibit the LARC2 kinase with uh, kinase inhibitors, these two sites become dephosphorylated. And we therefore, we made monoclonal antibodies to these two sites. And, uh, you know, this has become used as the, as, 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 as the main way to uh, assess the in vivo efficacy of, of LARC2 inhibitors. We now know that these aren't autophosphorylation sites. In fact, these report the confirmation of LARC2. So when LARC2 is in the inactive confirmation, these sites are phosphorylated. And when the, the kinase inhibitors are type 1 inhibitors that cause the LARC2 to adopt the active conformation, and this induces a conformational change that either promotes dephosphorylation of these sites or restricts their access to the upstream casein kinase 1-alpha that, that, that phosphorylates these sites. And, uh, you know, this is basically a summary of what I've just shown. At, at, at the time, we had polyclonal antibodies. I'm showing you here the original data where you incubate cells with the LARC2 inhibitors and, and you obtain, you know, dephosphorylation of these sites. And, and the monoclonal antibodies that, that, I mean, the data looks much better than this. So obviously the key question when you work on a kinase is what is the, uh, you know, the physiological substrate of the kinase and uh, how is it, um, you know, what does it phosphorylate? So we tried from, you know, from basically from 2004 to 2011 or 12 to, uh, you know, to, to find the substrate without success. And then very luckily this, this, this foundation called the Michael J. Fox Foundation based in New York became very interested in this problem. 
and, and they asked me to uh, put together a team of researchers to try and do this collaboratively rather than um, you know than just each, than, than, rather than every lab working a, alone so i put together a, a, you know what a, a fantastic team of researchers involving three different mass spectrometry groups including you know matthias mann who's the who's the world's most uh, well-known mass spectrometry scientist who's also the most cited scientist i think in, in the field of biology and then we had the gsk and merck who also provided us with uh, selective inhibitors and then we had knock-in mice which we treated with the uh, you know with the inhibitors and 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 key to this project was that yeah, all inhibitors have non-specific effects so when you do mass spectrometry of cells three to plus and minus inhibitors you see the specific effects plus the huge amount of non-selective effects and also when you make a knock-in mutation you know your mouse you know you know develops without this pathway and, and this results in uh, lots of secondary tertiary quaternary effects due to the lack of a pathway uh, being there so when you do the mass spectrometry you see lots of effects but they're not directly related to the the, the direct primary role of, of, of the kinase so to get around that we actually had to make a design a mutant that was a drug was we call drug resistant so we made a, a mutant in lark 2 that was resistant to 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 the kinase inhibitors and um, and, and this mutation doesn't change activity, but it just doesn't respond as, as, as well to the kinase inhibitor. So here, then what you do is that you treat the, 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 the wild type and the, and the kinase and resistance mutants are basically the same because LARC2 activity is the same in both models. So th there's no changes in, in the tissues of these animals. And, and then you add, you give them both the LARC2 inhibitor and then what happens is that you get dephosphorylation of the substrates in the wild type mouse, but not in the inhibitor resistant mouse. And, and that was really the key to, uh, you know, identify the substrates for LARC2, which, um, which basically turned out to be a, a group of, of RAB GTPases, such as RAB10, where LARC2 was directly phosphorylating these RABs. Um, these are GTPases, and they have an effector binding motif that's shown in blue here, and uh, and the LARC2 kinase phosphorylates these uh, you know these RAB proteins right in the center and the conserved residue of the uh, effector binding motif, and um, you know and, and and I just wanted to uh, and then it, then further work that you know then further work suggests that there was uh, not just one there was a whole group of around thirteen RAB proteins. That are all phosphorylated at this site by, uh, you, you know, by LARC2, and uh, and then this was a very collaborative effort with, uh, you know, with many of the people that are shown in this slide and, and the previous slide, and uh, you know, in my own lab as well were were heavily involved in this. So I, I just wanted to sort of I've just sort of summarised the key data here. I just wanted to show you a few slides to 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 persuade you that this is, is correct. And, um, you know, so basically, uh, this is the, uh, in this slide here, we're looking at, uh, a, you know, this is fibroblasts from wild type cells. And uh, you can see that uh, this is the phosphorylated RABs. This is a phosphatag gel that separates out the phosphorylated versus the dephosphorylated RAB protein. And you can see, interestingly, maybe this is why it was very hard to identify only about one or two percent of the uh, of the rab protein is phosphorylated you know most of it is dephosphorylated and then when you add the lark 2 inhibitor you get dephosphorylation of, of the rab protein but now when we take the cells from the uh, inhibitor resistant knock in mice here you can see you have to go to a uh, much higher so here you're a three nanomolar inhibitor you're getting dephosphorylation of the uh, of, of the rab protein when you add the inhibitor but now you've got to go to a uh, hundred nanomolar of the inhibitor to to uh, you know to see the dephosphorylation, and um, and and then we also made um, we also found that um, the R the pathogenic mutations of of LARC2, for example, like the R1441G knock-in mutation, also markedly enhanced 
the, the phosphorylation of, of the Rab proteins, which is consistent with the, uh, the, 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 the notion that the Rab proteins are disease relevant substrates of, of, of the LARC2 kinase. And when you treat with the LARC2 inhibitor, you, you lose this, uh, you lose this phosphorylation. And, and then we also worked with the Michael J. Fox Foundation to make, you know, uh, rabbit monoclonal antibodies to probe these phosphorylated rab proteins rather than doing phostag gels. And, you know, these reagents work fantastically. You can see that they only give one band or, on a gel. And, and, and obviously when you treat with inhibitor, they become dephosphorylated. And, uh, you, you know, and then we, we made all of these reagents available through Abcam. So everybody can just, uh, you know, order them and uh, use them for their research. And we've done this for many multiple RAB proteins like RAB8, RAB12, and others we've uh, generated uh, antibodies against. And, you know, these are very useful reagents because you can study the impact that the, the pathogenic mutations have on the pathway by plotting for enhanced RAB protein phosphorylation when you are... Uh, when, when you blot, so these are cells, and you can see that these three different pathogenic mutations enhance the uh, the phosphorylation of the Rab protein compared to their control. And if you make a knockout, or this is a kinase dead knock-in mutation, you you completely lose the phosphorylation of the Rab protein, really confirming that it's uh, it, it, I mean it's LARC2 mediated. And, um, you know, so in, in recent work, we've actually extended this analysis. So in the, in the previous slides, I told you there was three or four pathogenic mutations that activated LARC2. But in recent work that I've been doing with my colleague, Esther Samler, who's a neurologist, we've, uh, we've screened about 205 variants of LARC2 that have been linked to uh, Parkinson's disease. And, and these variants... Uh, found not just in the kinase and GTPase domain, but they're also found in other regions of the protein. And we've identified 45 variants out of the 205 we've screened that also activate the LARC2 kinase using the assays I, I, I showed you in the previous blot. So suggesting that there's many more mutations. Some of these are very rare, but uh, there's obviously many of them. So if you, if you, if you add up all the rare mutations, um, you know, it, it doesn't become so rare. And, um, uh, and so, um, you know, this knowledge is very useful because the people with these mutations and who have, uh, you know, Parkinson's disease, you know, should in the future qualify for entering, you know, LARC2 inhibitor trials. And we now know how, how, this, like, how these mutations likely activate the LARC2 kinase because in recent years, through the work of Ji Sun, who works in the in Memphis, you know, in St. Jude's Hospital and in, in Children's Hospital in in Memphis, he has uh, he has crystallized the or the, he's, he's done the Chi UM structure of the full length LARC two. So the full length LARC two, when you express it as a recombinant protein, it folds into an inactive uh, protein. So it's it's basically totally inactive. This form of of the LARC2. And the reason it's inactive is because you have the, the kinase domain is, is, is an inactive conformation and access to the substrate binding sites of the kinase domain is blocked by this leucine Ritz repeat protein that is uh, you know, wrapped around the, the kinase domain here. And, uh, and it turns out that uh, virtually all of these inactivating mutations I showed you on, on this slide. These all lie in interphase residues that uh, stabilize this inactive conformation of LARC2. So uh, we think that the, what's happening is that the, the mutations are basically affecting these, these stable interaction of the inactive form of LARC2, therefore by destabilizing this inactive conformation. And then this leads to, uh, you know, reduces the energy barrier needed to activate the kinase. And this is probably the mechanism by which all of the uh, activating mutants are, are working, apart from the, the, the couple that are in the kinase domain. And these are probably, the ones in the kinase domain are probably just stabilizing, you know, the kinase. And, 
And then also, I just want to show you what my, my colleague Esther Samler is doing now, is that she now takes neutrophils that have a lot of LARC2 in, in them from patients who have, uh, who have these various mutations. And, and, and you can see that in the patient samples, you can see elevation with, the, with these mutations of, uh, of RAB10 phosphorylation in the neutrophils isolated from the patients. And she always treats them with LARC2 inhibitors as well before she lyses them to demonstrate that, uh, that, that, that it's, it's the elevated, the, the phosphorylation that is seen is mediated by LARC2 phosphorylation. And then the ones shown in here are, are, the, are the rare mutations. So these, these mutations here are the, are the rare mutations, including, I think, this one and this one that, that were identified from our previous biochemical analysis. And then she identified people who had these mutations and she was able to uh, obtain the blood to do the, the analysis. So, uh, and it's quite interesting. It turns out there's some many, there's quite a lot of people who, who don't have mutations in LARC2, but have familial Parkinson's disease, who also display elevation of the LARC2 kinase pathway activity through these assays. So there's clearly other mutations that are causing Parkinson's disease by activating this pathway. And, uh, you know, this is a very useful assay to maybe uh, identify, you know, such pathways. So, so the key question was, once we had discovered the Rab protein phosphorylation, was to identify what's downstream of the of, of this of this pathway. You know, what's the next step of the signaling pathway? And we were helped here because we, you know, we had, we we realized that since only one or two percent of the Rab protein was phosphorylated, the probably the way this was working was that the the LARC2 phosphorylated Rab protein would be able to bind. And since the phosphorylation site was in the middle of the effector binding region, the, the phosphorylated RABs would be able to bind to uh, you know, a new set of uh, effectors that the dephosphorylated protein can't bind to. So uh, we went fishing for proteins that could only bind to the LARC2 phosphorylated RAB proteins. And we identified these four proteins that interestingly all had an RH2 motif in them. And it turns out that this motif is the, is the, is the, is the, is the, it has some arginine, so it forms an alpha helix with some arginine and lysine residues located in a specific orientation that docks onto the, the, the LARC2 phosphorylated, you know, RAB proteins. So, uh, so basically the model is that, you know, like other GTPAs is, you know, RAB proteins are taken to the, uh, to, to the membrane of cells and, uh, you know, GEFs, you know, activate them and they combine to normal effectors. And this, this is the normal pathway. And I, I, I should have said there's about 70 RAB proteins in, in the cell and these play vital roles in regulating vesicular trafficking, membrane, and membrane and organelle homeostasis. Is, is all controlled by these Rab proteins. And, and this is the normal biology that occurs. But then in the case of LARC2, you know, uh, I believe LARC2 is recruited to the membrane of cells, and I'll, I'll discuss that in, the, in, in a few slides time. The LARC2 will then phosphorylate the, the Rab protein in this effector binding motif. And I didn't say that, but once this site is phosphorylated, it can no longer bind to the chaperone protein such as GDI, that move it around the cells or the effector binding proteins because this, this phosph phosphorylation abolishes these interactions. And instead, this exposes this phosphorylated motif to bind to these other effector proteins. And, and this then stimulates you know, further downstream biology. So we're exploring this uh, you know, deeply. And one of the uh, you know, one of the pathways that is best understood, and this is really the work from Susan Pfeffer's laboratory, who, who we've collaborated with a bit at the University of Stanford. She has, um, you know, she has shown that, uh, you know, what happens is that when you get phosphorylation of Rab proteins and the RILPEL1 binds to uh, the phosphorylated Rab proteins, this inhibits ciliogenesis. And, and you can, and, and, you know, you can measure, the, you can see this in cell lines as, as well as in, uh, you know, neurons. 
And when you activate the LARC2 pathway, you sort of inhibit this, this ciliogenesis pathway. And in neurons, what happens is that this, uh, th th this affects the, the response to sonic hedgehog signalings. And this reduces this GDNF signaling pathway that maintains dopaminergic neurons healthy. So this could be one mechanism by which overactivation of this pathway by inhibiting ciliogenesis could affect uh, you know, the survival of uh, dopaminergic neurons and, and, and be responsible for Parkinson's disease. And this is sort of one area of uh, you know, very active investigation in this, uh, you know, in this research field. But I would just like to come now to what's upstream of LARC2. How is, how is the LARC2 kinase activated? And, uh, and, we, and, and to address this question, we, as, I, as I've alluded before, we wondered whether other disease, other, other genes associated with Parkinson's disease, you know, could also lead to the activation of the LARC2 kinase. So there's about 20 genes that have, are clearly associated in a monogenetic manner to, to, to Parkinson's disease that are, uh, that are listed here. And we've tested most of these by either getting mice with these mutations or getting patients with these mutations to see how this impacts the LARC2 pathway. And, and we basically found two, two of the 20 seem to be really key in activating this LARC2 uh, pathway. So the first I'm going to talk to you about is, is RAB29. It's another RAB protein. It's also one of the RAB proteins that is also a substrate of, uh, of the LARC2. And, and what we found was that uh, when we uh, over and, and the mutations that cause Parkinson's disease seem to result in the overexpression of this, uh, this RAB29 protein. And so when we find when you, when you overexpress the RAB29 protein in cells, it, RAB29 is located on the trans-Golgi network. The LARC2 in the cell all goes to the Golgi membrane. And uh, this is because this, this, this region between 350 and 500 in the armadillo domain binds to RAB29 in its dephosphorylated form extremely tightly. And once it goes to the trans-Golgi network, the LARC2 becomes activated because we can see increased autophosphorylation of LARC2, and we also see enhanced phosphorylation of RAB29 and, 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 and its other substrates, such as RAB10, at, you know, at this location. And so the idea is that, um, that the RABs, are, you know, and, and then so the idea is that LARC2 is recruited to membranes or like vesicles or organelles such as the Golgi network, where it becomes activated. And um, it turns out now through a lot of work that I, I won't have time to, to talk to you about, that this uh, armadillo domain region of, of LARC2, it has at least uh, three different sets of RAB binding sites. It has site one that binds RAB29, it also binds RAB8 and RAB10, these in the dephosphorylated forms will, will recruit LARC2 to different membranes in the cell and uh, where it becomes activated. It seems that the, the membrane that is, the, the membrane is important, but not the, not the location. So if, if you artificially attach GRAB29 to the plasma membrane or the mitochondria or to the ER, the LARC2 will move to all of these organelles and, and, and also become activated. So it just seems that the the recruitment to the membrane is the is the key activating uh, process, and obviously working out the molecular mechanism by which this occurs is is really important. The second site is an N terminal site that we call site two, and this site seems to bind to phosphorylated Rab eight and ten with much higher affinity than the dephosphorylated Rabs, and so this could be a feed forward site. So once you start getting some phosphorylated Rabs on the membranes phosphorylation of these sites is, is recruiting more RAB to, 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 to that site to that, to, of, of the membrane through this site two interactions. And then there's this third site, this is the last identified site that binds RAB12. And, and, and in red, I've shown you these, uh, these residues that you can mutate in LARC2 to specifically abolish each one of these sites. And these have been these mutations have been very useful for 
defining the importance of, of these sites. So it turns out when you mutate this site, you uh, you reduce LARC2 activity in the cell by about 60 or 70 percent. When you mutate this site, you, you reduce the activity by maybe around 30 to 40 percent, suggesting that these two sites, uh, you know, play critical, uh, you know, roles in, in regulating the basal activity of uh, of LARC2. And so we, we don't know, as I said before, exactly how LARC2 is activated at the membrane, but the laboratory of Ji Sun in, uh, in, in, in St. Jude's Hospital has, uh, has, has done the cryo-EM structure of uh, LARC2 bound to RAB29. And he's got three different structures when he's done the uh, when he's done when he's done this you know the first structure is uh the uh the inactive monomer structure i showed you before bound to rab 29 through this site one motif the second structure is you can get a uh, a, 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 a you know a dimer of the inactive form of of lark 2 in which you have two molecules of lark 2 bound to two molecules of of rab 29 and these are both in the inactive state Nothing terribly interesting about these two structures, but the, his third structure he got was quite dramatic, and where you have a tetramer structure of two inactive molecules of LARC2 acting as a platform for two activated molecules of LARC2 to bind to, in which the leucine rich repeat now moves away from the uh, you know from for, you know from the kinase domain, exposing you know the kinase domain active sites. You know, which are actually pointing in the right direction to uh, to phosphorylate a, a rad protein at you know at the membrane, and uh, you know so uh, you know so you know further work is needed to uh, you know to validate this this idea of, of how the LARC2 might be activated at, at at the membrane. So this other protein that activates LARC2 is is called VPS thirty five, and uh, and this is a this, so this is this is this is a cargo binding protein that forms a complex with two other genes proteins VPS twenty six and VPS twenty nine and this is called the retromo complex and what this complex does is based in the endosomes and is and and, and and it mediates the recycling of protein cargos from the endosomes to the plasma membrane and this is called the recycling pathway but it also transports proteins from the endosomes to the Golgi. And this is called the retrograde uh, pathway, and, uh, and 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 as you know, endosomes then develop into in, into lysosomes. And there's this mutation, aspartic acid 620 N mutation, that's located far away from the cargo binding domain. And this mutation is linked to uh, you know to Parkinson's disease. And what we found was that in, in mice and, and and people with this. 620N mutation, you uh, you see a dramatically enhanced Rab protein phosphorylase in, in in the cells and the tissues from from these mice and people. And I'm showing you here the data from the the human studies. We obviously have the we have the same data from from from, from mice, and you can see in the human studies the the Rab10 phosphorylase is low if you take people with idiopathic Parkinson's disease or wild type donors. But when you have people who have this uh, 620N mutation? You can see, you can see, you know, significantly elevated uh, Rab10 phosphorylation. So, so the question was, how is this mutation activating LARC2? So we've done a lot of work on this, but uh, you know, what what our idea is is that it, that this mutation is somehow affecting this cargo transport from the endosomes. So proteins that should be transported to the Golgi or or, or to or to the plasma membrane aren't getting properly recycled and, and sorted away from the endosomes. So this these proteins then end up in the lysosomes, uh, and we think that the lysosomes are slightly they've got the wrong composition of proteins in them, which uh, which, which 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 predisposes them to uh, dysfunction or stress, uh, and we think that this is the trigger. For the activation of the LARC2 pathway, so uh, if you treat cells with agents that damage lysosomes, you can you can you can recruit LARC2 to the lysosomes, and you can get Rab10 phosphorylation at these organelles. So uh, you know the hypothesis is that the stressed lysosome is somehow 
leading to the activation of a Rab protein on the surface of the lysosome. This is recruiting and activating LARC2. This is then phosphorylating Rab10. So um, we've done, I'm, I'm just conscious of time here, so I, I don't want to dwell too long on this, but we've done mass spectrometry experiments where we, we identified that, uh, that, a, that, a, that basically the, the key target that this phosphorylated Rab protein binds to under these conditions of lysosome stress is the, is the real PEL1 protein. This is the key phosphoadapter protein I, I, I showed you with the RH2 domain that, uh, that, that binds to the, uh, the, the phosphorylated Rab proteins. And then we've done further mass spectrometry experiments that uh, have identified that when you when you look for proteins that bind to specifically bind to only the phosphorylated Rab8 Rilpel1 complex, we identify one other protein that is called TMEM55B. This is a uh, you know a lysosomal transmembrane protein. It has a conserved domain. And you know this binds, uh, you know, very specifically to, uh, you know, to, uh, to 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 the phosphorylated Rab proteins, and uh, but it won't it won't bind to the, the when you mutate this site in the RH2 domain that ab abolishes the binding of RILPEL1 to phosphorab8, you, uh, you you lose the binding, and. Uh, we, we can see interaction of the RILPs and TMEM55B on the lysosomes in, um, you know, in cells. So uh, this is an experiment where you're seeing the, the interaction between the RILPEL1 and the TMEM55B. But when you treat with the, the LARC2 inhibitor to, to inhibit the pathway, you lose the interactions completely. So we think that you're getting stress lysosomes. Uh, that might have under, uh, be undergoing lysophagy or other modifications, and this is triggering the recruitment of LARC2 to these uh, to, to these damaged lysosomes. So, so this this is the this is where we are with the dissection of the pathway. We now know two part. We know we now know that downstream of LARC2, you have RABs and RILPs and now the TMEM55B, uh, and we actually think that this TMEM55B might be a an E3 ligase. And and, and and then whose activity might be regulated by this pathway, and uh, you know this is currently being in, investigated in, in the laboratory. So I don't have tell, time to tell you about the Rab phosphatase because I want to leave some time for questions. But the, the model is that you have Rabs and gaps. You have Rabs that are regulated by GEFs and gaps, and there's a new dimension of regulation when you have a uh, the LARC2 kinase phosphorylating the Rabs that will enable it to bind to new effectors and trigger further downstream biology. And it turns out that other kinases, including the, the relative of LARC2 called LARC1 and other kinases can phosphorylate just different members of the Rab proteins at the same site, probably to trigger the same downstream biology. And it's possible that other Rab, prote other GTPase proteins are also regulated by a similar mechanism. So, uh, you know, maybe the RAS and other things that you might work on might be in, involved in this pathway. So I think I've talked about all of this one way or the other in my talk. We think this organelle dysfunction, you know, triggers the, the activation of RABs through unknown pathways at the surface of these membranes. This recruits LARC2 by different mechanisms to these membranes where it becomes activated. It phosphorylates a group of of Rab proteins, and then probably there's still lots to discover here, but just one of the pathways we found is this lysosomal pathway that uh, we're going to investigate further. And then I just want to finally just come back to the patients. You know, I told you that, uh, you know, all of this work suggested that uh, LARC2 inhibitors might be useful for treating uh, from people. So there's many companies have embarked in this area. The company that's most advanced is Denali, who are working with another company called Biogen. And then they, they did two phase one clinical trials with compounds called 151 and, and 201 that's, that they will claim to work efficacy and, uh, and be well tolerated. So this 151 now compound has now entered you know, late phase clinical trials with both people with LARC2 driven disease and also idiopathic disease and there's other companies 
are also developing similar inhibitors but further further behind and Biogen also have an antisense oligonucleotide approach where they do in, intrathecal injections with antisense approaches to LARC2. But what was uh, what was fantastic for, for us was that, uh, you know, in Dundee, through the work of Esther Samler, we, we actually have a clinical trial center that, uh, that is also participating in this LARC2 uh, inhibitor trials. And I, I got on the 18th of April, I was able to... Uh, go and witness, like we, we can't show the, the, the pics of the patient, but I was able to go and see the first patient in the UK who was treated either with the placebo or the LARC2 inhibitor. So, uh, you know, that was a very nice moment. And just by chance, uh, Alexander Zimpritz, he, he's the person who first cloned LARC2, was visiting us in Dundee. And, uh, you know, so he could come as well. So, so it, was, it, was, it, was, it was really nice after 19 years of research to uh, you, you know to witness this uh, in, in person and uh, you know I, ho I haven't really had time to acknowledge all the people as I've gone through the work but uh, obviously many people over the years have uh, have made huge contributions to the research I've talked about and have you know devoted a lot of their their their, their efforts to to this project and uh, you know I'm immensely grateful for 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 their work and. Uh, you know, I'm very happy to uh, to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dario, for this wonderful lecture. So I think it's a good example of having patience you know, after 19 years uh, to have. No, it was wonderful. Out of all the other areas I've worked on, I I don't know whether the work has ever led to. It. Well, we don't know if this has leads. There's there's been a hundred clinical trials before in Parkinson's disease, and they've all failed. There's never been one that's so. Yeah. So the, 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 the odds from history are, are low, but we know that in cancer, treating cancers driven by kinases are, are often uh, beneficial. Yeah. In bet. the case of Parkinson's disease, it's a slow progressing disease. So it's possible that by the time you have the symptoms, the pathway has been activated for a long time and stopping the pathway may no longer you know, lead to much more benefit. So that we don't know, but that's obviously what we need to test. Yeah, but Dario, it reminds me a lot also of RAS. So it's 40 years since the first mutation of RAS to a RAS inhibitor has taken 40 years, almost 40 years to have an inhibitor there. But this is half the time. So it's, I would say, much better in this okay. case. Okay, well, that's, that's uh, it's easier. It's a kinase. It's a kinase. Yeah, yeah, it's easier than RAS, of yes, course. But, yeah, RAS was but very it's, hard. It's in neuroscience that it's not so... Say, yes, no, there's obviously in the past there's been much less investment. Yeah. People are, now people are surviving cancer. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, then what's happening now, the numbers of people developing neurological diseases are going up because they're yeah. not dying of cancer and heart yeah. disease as well, you know, with all the statins and everything. So we're not dying of heart disease or cancer as much. And yeah. therefore, you, you know, we'll, 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 we'll develop, more people will develop neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. Which, is, which, which, which in a way means there's more funding in this area I, than I fully, used to be. I fully agree. And with uh, a little bit of the excitement in Alzheimer also to slow down this couple of drugs that can maybe... Yes, no, no, that's, it shows it's possible. There's a, there's, there's a, it's, yeah, it's probably where the kinase, the, the cancer field was, uh, you know, 30 years ago, maybe. Yeah, yeah. With Gleevec or something, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. We have several questions more specific and general. Uh, one uh, question is... Um, for, for example, in the in the families, you have uh, the mutation there in all cells, but you have mostly a phenotype in in the brain in the Parkinson here. So, how is the LARC2 expressed in all tissues? Why there's only yes. a phenotype there? So, how, yes. how is this explained? So, so, the, so very interestingly, it's very low in, in in neurons. So it's actually very high in immune cells. So that was one of the curious things about LARC2 because you think a kinase involved in Parkinson's disease it'd be brain specific or something yeah. but the opposite is true so uh you know so um just because it's low it doesn't mean it has, doesn't play an important role yeah it's in some in some ways so a protein that's present at low levels in the cell the cell is most dependent on that low level of activity but th there's also a, a school of thought that this could be playing a role in the immune system so these mutations that activate the kinase 
might be very good when you're young to prevent you from opportunistic infections. And this could have been very good, you know, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, where you might have a slightly increased chance of getting through childhood by having these mutations. And in those days, no one lived past 30, so it wasn't a <clears throat> Parkinson's disease wasn't a problem. But obviously, this higher immune system could result in neuroinflammation as you yeah. get older. Uh, and, and this could cause uh, Parkinson's disease. And in fact, people who are on uh, anti-TNF therapies uh, have been shown to have reduced rates of Parkinson's disease because uh, maybe because you have reduced neuroinflammation. So th that could be the reason why it's, uh, it's um, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's, it's not the present at high levels in the brain. Yeah. And, uh, and I understand that the, the targets of, uh, of the kinase in other tissues are the same, are perhaps GTPases, the same targets? This yes, is... everything. It's always this. The, the, in our hands, there's only the RABs. The, these 13 RABs are the only substrates. Although we can't rule out that there's not other substrates. And there's, there's literally hundreds of papers claiming other substrates, but no one's ever validated them, you know. So... Uh, they're all in vitro or overexpressing and things, but the RABs are the only ones where you can you can go and take a, an antibody and, and study them and prove validate them that they're that they're, they're genuine substrates. Uh, my question is: um, uh, What are these sporadic Parkinson's with mutations? Uh, what, are, what what is the mutation everywhere or in in the brain? What, yeah. What... So uh, so yeah. No. So with many diseases, there's it's the same thing that. There's five or ten percent of of the people who have a clear cut mutation, or they have a family, you know, history, and uh, and you can find so some so some have a family history, and you can't find a mutation because it, there's it's probably a very rare mutation, and it hasn't been discovered yet or characterized yet, so it's not clear, but it, but it's likely to be familial because you have that family history, and. Uh, and then you have people who have a clear mutation in one of these 20 genes I, I, I showed. Yeah. But then you have 90% of people who, who don't have a family history of Parkinson's. And, and for, so for those people, it's, it's, it's possible it's partly genetic, partly environmental. So mm -hmm. you know, people who, were, who live close to, I mean, pesticides and herbicides, uh, you know, they have, uh, they, they have very toxic uh, molecules in, inside them that uh, are linked to Parkinson's disease. So, so farmers or people who live close to farms have much higher rates of Parkinson's disease than, uh, than someone who lives in the city, for example. And people have shown this, you know, very... And then, and then there's about 90 GWAS genes that have been found that increase your risk by 1% or 2%. And uh, so it's, it's probably a combination of, and then the infection, people claim that, you know, if you have infections that can boost the immune system, you know, you can also, uh, you know, so maybe it's a combination of all of these factors yeah. that are causing the sporadic forms. And but, well, so it's very hard to know what the cause is. Yeah. And, and these sporadic forms, uh, there are changes in the, in the phosphorylation of the stream targets in that? Yes, no. So, no? Uh, We've looked about 200 people with sporadic Parkinson's, and for most of them, we see no activation of, of the pathway. But um, it could be that there's low activation that's very hard to uncover. And uh, so that's what the clinical trials will uncover. So yeah. the clinical and trials will help us understand whether only the people with mutations might benefit or will people with sporadic disease. Yeah. Also benefits, yeah. and uh, this is was here. So uh, I understand for the inherited forms of Parkinson, they are given uh, L, L dopa also, like in the sporadic. Yes. yes. And L dopa is able to change phosphorylation there. No. 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 So L dopa, no. So L dopa doesn't. So the L dopa just substitute. So when you have Parkinson, you you lack the L dopa. So this is just. Uh, affecting the uh it's reducing the tremors and uh and, and the slowness of movement and and it's and it's it's obviously the hard thing is to administer it at the right dose at the right time because and in the right place because when you take it all over through the body 
you, you start having side effects and you start becoming resistant to the L-dopa and uh, you, you know it's it's you know has some side effects yeah and uh, another question um taking in, in account your, your important work in characterizing the downstream targets and that upstream upstream pathways also uh converging there so uh, uh, probably you are thinking of, of targeting these pathways these enzymes downstream it's another way, not targeting the kind of... Right, yeah, no, fantastic question. Kind. So, uh, yes, that, that's a very exciting question. So, I, I didn't talk about it. There's a phosphatase called ppm one hates that dephosphorylates the lab proteins. And uh, we're, we're working with a, with a German company called Evotech to, to see if we can find an activator of the ppm one hates This is very ambitious to try and find an activator of a phosphatase. But yeah. if you could activate the phosphatase, you would counteract the log two, and then and then obviously people have made uh, you know these sites one, two, and three that I, I I reported on. If you could find a compound that would bind to uh, to those sites and block the rabs from docking to that site, that that could also be a, a, a sort of a very selective way to uh, inhibit the log two pathway activity. The other things that people are trying is that most of the inhibitors that are being developed are type one inhibitors that cause the like two to adopt the active conformation, but that might be not perfect because the enzyme adopts this pathogenic conformation when it's bound to the drug, and this pathogenic conformation might cause aggregation or, or, or people have found it binds to microtubules when when you do this. And, and that's undesirable, maybe so, because uh, it causes roadblocks in the in, 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 in the microtubules the dynamics. So, uh, so people are trying to develop type two inhibitors that would trap the LARC two and in the inactive conformation. And you know that might be, uh, you yeah. know, that could also be maybe better. Well, another question is: uh, you mentioned that kinase inhibitors may work. Uh, significantly in vitro but not in cells uh, probably at one point uh, uh, no, the, the kinase inhibitors uh, maybe I, 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 I misspoke uh, but uh, they, they should work in uh, they, they should work in they, 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 all the kinase inhibitors that have been developed uh, work very well in mouse models and, and, and cells and in vitro yes, yes it's, it's well understood also that um, we'll, we'll have something else I ah, yes um, what about a combination in in the clinical trials that you mentioned? There's one clinical trial, and, and I love that picture from the discovery of the mutation to to you for the biochemical analysis. So, can you combine those with L-DOPA? Are people starting to do that, or it's planned? Yeah, no, so the patients will always take the the standard. It's a treatment of Parkinson's. You, you need L-DOPA. Anyway, the patients come off as a total disaster. They, they you know, they, they obviously they you know so. So, so, the, so basically, the uh, the trials with the like two inhibitors are on top of all their standard, okay. you know, therapies that they take. Okay. And uh, yes, yeah, so there, there would be a total. Yeah, my clinical colleague says, you know, uh, without uh, dopamine therapies, yeah. it would be a total disaster. Yeah. Uh... Um I, I think uh, that, that's it from our side because we're in at, at time. We promise it will yes. be an hour, <laughs> close to one hour. And, okay, and, good. And it was great. So let's let's clap the speaker for okay, his well, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, hopefully uh the, I should have said actually the, 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 you never know, there might be some relevance to LARC2 in, in cancer. I, I think there are a few papers. Suggesting Absolutely. a few mutations. Oh, and, and what you mentioned about the immune system, the impact of the immune system, maybe have an impact in immunotherapy. There are many things that we can think of, uh, about that. Great. <laughs> okay. So, thank you very much then. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.